1953, a short paper called Equations of State Calculations by Fast Computing Machines was published in the Journal of Chemical Physics. The paper developed a new algorithm for quickly calculating important physical properties based off a new method that had just been recently invented a few years ago, the Monte Carlo method. Unbeknownst to the paper's authors, they had produced an algorithm that would go on to become one of the most important algorithms of the 20th century. This algorithm is now known as the Metropolis algorithm. For something so prominent, you'd think that its significance was instantly recognizable. While the physicists of the time knew it was useful, for almost 40 years it remained virtually unknown by another group who would have greatly benefited from its use, the statisticians. In this video, you'll learn about the Metropolis algorithm, how it works, and why it's so important to the field of statistics. If you're new to this channel, thanks for tuning in. My name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. The Metropolis algorithm can be described in just a few lines, but the simplicity is deceiving. The goal of the algorithm is to recreate a sample from a known and possibly complex probability distribution. First, you start at some initial point. Then we generate a second point from a known probability distribution, which we may or may not go to. The probability that we go to this new point is given by this weird expression here. You either accept this new point and go there, or reject it and stay where you currently are. And after that, you repeat this entire process using this new point as the basis. And somehow, some way, the sample you get will start to look like the probability distribution you wanted. If that's still confusing to you, don't worry, I'll walk through a more applied example of how the algorithm works. But if you want to see right away how the algorithm works, you can go to this timestamp here. As I'm editing this video, I'm getting ready for the Joint Statistical Meeting, or JSM. This year, it's located in Portland, and I've never been before. In between interviews for a potential job, I want to spend some time enjoying the city of Portland itself. I want to spend my time in Portland like a local. For simplicity, let's say that these five things represent all the things a Portland local does. If these proportions represent the amount of time a local spends doing these activities, then I want to spend all my waking hours to be spent like this. My goal is to recreate this target distribution, a distribution of my time. But here's the problem. If you try to ask anyone how they spend their time, no one is going to be able to tell you these exact proportions like I've described. The Metropolis algorithm says that that's not a problem. First, I just need to pick an activity to start. I drink a lot of coffee, so I'm going to start there. I'll spend a fixed amount of time enjoying the vibes, and then it'll be time to figure out where to go next. Rather than consult Instagram or go where the wind tells me, the Metropolis algorithm says that I should choose my next activity at random. After asking my favorite random number generator, it picks hiking for me. But I don't go immediately hiking. The Metropolis algorithm says I need to ask a local to compare what I'm doing now to what I propose to do next. Even though the average Portlander won't know my target distribution, it's easier to pick between two options, drinking coffee versus going hiking. In order for the Metropolis algorithm to work, the local needs to process my options in the following way. If the local thinks they'd spend more time hiking compared to drinking coffee, then they'll just immediately tell me to go hiking. On the other hand, if they actually prefer drinking coffee more, they'll compare their preference to hiking to their preference to coffee, and they might even actually tell me to stay, depending on how strong these preferences are. No matter what the local tells me, I'm going to listen to their suggestion and do that activity for another hour or so. And from there, I repeat this process all over again, come up with a proposal, ask a local, and then obey what they tell me to do. And if I repeat this process for long enough, the Metropolis algorithm guarantees that the time I spent based on the local suggestions will come to closely resemble my target distribution. The mystery of the Metropolis algorithm is this connection between what I do locally, that is, from hour to hour, from what I want to do globally, my target distribution. The Metropolis algorithm is what's called a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, or MCMC for short. Monte Carlo refers to the use of random number generation to calculate useful statistical objects, like an expected value or a complicated probability distribution. Markov chains are a huge topic that I can't possibly cover in one video, so you're just going to get the bare basics needed to understand the algorithm. Like its name suggests, it's a chain, a chain of values with special properties. All Markov chains start with an initial value, or state, chosen at random from a collection of possible states, which I'll denote as S and I'll call it the state space. 
This base represents all the possible values that a part of the chain can take. From this initial state, the chain will transition to another value in the state space. The probability that it will transition to some other state y is defined by what's called a transition distribution. The transition distribution describes the conditional probability of starting at the current value of the chain and going to another state in the space. In other contexts, you might see it described as a matrix, but for the purposes of this video, it's better to keep it as a probability distribution. Based on the transition distribution, the next state is picked and becomes the second state in the chain. This process is repeated, conditioning on this new value. And this process can go on indefinitely, or more likely, we decide how long this process will repeat itself. Here's the key point. Under certain conditions, the samples that make up a Markov chain can form a fixed probability distribution, also known as a stationary distribution, which I'll denote as pi x. This is surprising when you consider the fact that the value of one part of the chain only depends on the value that came directly before it. In simpler problems, we can use random number generators to implement Monte Carlo methods. In an MCMC method, it's a Markov chain that generates the random samples. What distinguishes a Markov chain from a random number generator is complexity. Distributions like the normal or binomial distribution are nice because they have useful properties, have convenient equations, and most importantly, are easy to generate data from. But in general, that's not always the case. You can take a continuous function, f of x, and divide it by its integral. This division normalizes the area under the curve to be equal to 1, so that it's a valid probability distribution. Despite how it looks, this entire integral is just a constant, so we can rewrite the probability distribution to be the product of the normalizing constant times f of x. Even though we know it's a constant, it's not always guaranteed that we can actually calculate it. You can see an example of this in Bayes' theorem, where the normalizing constant is an integral over the possible ways the data could have been generated. For even just a moderately difficult problem, this integral is difficult or even impossible to calculate. MCMC methods deal with this problem in a way that many of us are familiar with, by avoiding it. I mentioned that Markov chains are made of two things, the state space and the transition distribution. And under the right conditions, the samples that come out of the chain will come to form some stationary distribution. From there, we might want to study what these conditions are such that a stationary distribution arises out of the either. The Metropolis algorithm flips this logic around. Instead, we start with a state space and a known stationary distribution, which we'll refer to as the target distribution. This distribution doesn't need to be simple like the normal or binomial. As long as it has this particular form, it's fair game for Metropolis. Since we have a probability distribution, the corresponding state space is the support for this distribution. What we need to figure out is a transition distribution that will let us do this. Easier said than done, but as I'll show you, there's a clear logic to it. A good place to start is our need for a stationary distribution. A sufficient condition to create a stationary distribution is that the transition distribution must satisfy a condition known as detailed balance. Roughly speaking, detailed balance says that for any two states, x and y, the probability of starting at x and going to y is equal to the probability of starting at y and going to x. It's not easy to see what this has to do with creating a stationary distribution, so we'll derive a more visual intuition through my Portland example. Let's say that the population of Portland stays fixed at 100, and that at any given moment, some proportion of them are doing each activity. You can think of these numbers as representing pi of x, the probability that someone is doing some activity. At any point, someone can move to a different activity, and the probability that they'll do this is given by the transition distribution. When a person chooses something else to do, you can think of them as flowing from one activity to the other. Just by looking at one person alone, you might think that this would decrease the number of people at one activity and increase the number at the other. But under detailed balance, this flow from one state to another is balanced by the flow in the opposite direction. The net result is that the number of people at each activity won't change, even if people are flowing between them. And it's not just for one pair of nodes, detailed balance is happening for all pairs of activities in Portland. The end result is a stationary distribution across all of the states. What this means for us is that if we can show that a transition distribution satisfies detailed balance, then the resulting Markov chain is guaranteed to have the stationary distribution we want. To figure that out, it might be easier to see what we need to do when there isn't detailed balance. When we don't have detailed balance, 
there's some pair of states x and y such that the flow from x to y is too common and the flow from y to x is too rare. So we have to patch this up. One way to fix this imbalance is to limit the ability of the chain to move from x to y. Instead of allowing x to move to y every time, you can reduce this flow by only allowing it with some probability. To represent this, we'll split the transition distribution into two parts. The function g will still represent some conditional probability distribution, but now there's a new alpha function here. The purpose of this function is to act as a sort of gatekeeper for allowing transitions from x to y. I'll refer to it as the acceptance function. As I've described it, the probability from going from y to x is already too rare. We want detailed balance to hold, so we should maximize this low flow from y to x. We can set it to 1 on this right side, so we're not limiting this transition any further. To achieve detailed balance, we can set these two sides equal to each other and isolate the acceptance function. What we get is a ratio of these two terms, and the form of this function is worth noting. By taking the ratio of the target distributions, the constants cancel out, and as a result, the Metropolis algorithm avoids the need to calculate this constant in the first place. Since I'm interpreting the output of this acceptance function as a probability, we need to limit how high it can go. When the numerator is greater than the denominator, the function is greater than 1, so we can set the minimum between this ratio and 1. If we use an acceptance function with this form, then our transition distribution will achieve detailed balance. And therefore, a Markov chain using this function will create samples from our target distribution. And that's why this strange little function allows the metropolis to do what it needs to do. Sometimes you'll hear the metropolis algorithm be referred to as the metropolis Hastings algorithm. Remember that Metropolis's original paper was a physics paper, largely inaccessible to statisticians of the time. It was W.K. Hastings who expanded on Metropolis's work and put it into terms that statisticians would better understand. No algorithm video is complete without seeing it in action. So let's analyze some data. Since I'm on YouTube, I keep an eye on a few metrics from my videos to make sure that they're doing okay and to inflate my own ego. One of those metrics is the proportion of viewers who like the video. What I want to know is the average like to view ratio of my past 10 videos. But here's my problem. I'm not sure how to combine the data from all my past videos. What stops me is that I have two different formats for my videos. I call them explainers and edutainment. One approach I could take is to group all of their views and likes together and estimate a single like to view ratio. This gives me more data to work with, but it ignores the fact that I have different types of videos. Another approach I could take is to just estimate a like to view ratio for all the videos separately, but then I'll have 10 different ratios and they're going to be wildly different. So I'm going to go down a middle road here. I'm going to use a Bayesian hierarchical model to analyze the data. This will let me use the data from all my videos while enabling me to get a single ratio to summarize. I'm going to treat each video like a binomial distribution. This corresponds to the likelihood of the data. Next, I'm going to assume that these like-to-view ratios come from their own distribution, in this case, a beta distribution, which has its own parameters alpha and beta. This is what makes the model hierarchical. This beta distribution forms part of the prior. But since I'm doing a fully Bayesian analysis, the parameters for this beta distribution also need their own prior. These are also called hyperpriors, and I have no idea what the values for these could be. So I'm going to use a particular form for the prior that was recommended by Andrew Gelman. Taken together, the posterior distribution looks like this. Proportional to the likelihood of all the videos, the distribution of all the proportions, and the hyperpriors. Altogether, this posterior distribution consists of 12 parameters. For my proposal distribution, I'll be using a uniform distribution in honor of what Metropolis used in his original paper. You'll notice that I've included an argument here for the half width of the uniform, and I'll explain why later. In the interest of time, I'll show you my implementation of the Metropolis algorithm here and just let you pause and read the comments. But if you want the code and the data I used, I'll also link it in the description. Now, this was supposed to be the part where I showed you a clean animation where the histograms of the posterior develop over time. This algorithm isn't hard to implement, but getting it to run is an awful experience. And I thought it would make for a good teaching moment. Here's one of my test runs here. One thing you should check with an MCMC algorithm is that it's exploring the target distribution correctly. Without going into the details, the way you know this is happening is that the chain forms a nice even band when you plot them against iteration. But here, I definitely don't have this. If I see this, then any results I get from the Markov chain are going to be unreliable, because the chain hasn't found what it's supposed to be sampling from. 
I have no idea what the posterior distributions for the alpha and beta parameters are, so I don't have a good idea of what initial values I should use. Not only that, but I'm not sure what half width I should use to generate the proposals. The half width dictates how fast the chain will explore the posterior distribution. If it's too small, then you don't explore the target distribution, even with tens of thousands of iterations. If it's too large, you barely explore it at all. And to make matters worse, the best width for the proposal can vary wildly depending on the model and the data. Despite hours of trying, I couldn't get my implementation of the Metropolis algorithm to work. I cheated and used another algorithm to analyze my results. I used Stan, which uses the NUTS algorithm. The goal of my analysis was to analyze the average like to view ratio of my past 10 videos. To calculate this, I can get the posterior distribution of the sample mean by taking the ratio of the alpha parameter divided by alpha plus beta. This is defined for the beta distribution. Looking at the posterior distribution, the average like to view ratio is 5.8% with the 95% credible interval between 5.1% and 6.6%. I wanted to mention this because I thought it really highlighted not just the highs of the Metropolis algorithm, but also the lows. It still stands that the Metropolis algorithm is one of the most important algorithms developed in the 20th century. But it's not on this list because it's the best, or because it's the most efficient. It's on this list because it's a pioneer. The Metropolis algorithm is the first MCMC algorithm to ever to be invented. And with its invention, it unlocked the ability to deal with complicated, high-dimensional probability distributions that were previously out of reach for people. So the Metropolis algorithm greatly expanded the practicality of a whole new mode of statistical analysis. While we may not use Metropolis much today, what we have today would have not have been possible without it. Before I end this video, I want to thank the Summer of Math Exposition community for holding this competition. Videos like this are a chance for me to expand my knowledge of statistics to topics that were only lightly covered or even ignored in my own coursework. I hope that you've learned just as much as I have in the research for this video. If you like statistics and like this video, then consider subscribing for more. I also have a newsletter that you can sign up for to get videos delivered straight to your inbox. That's it for this one. That's it for this one. I'll see you next time.